Okay, let me just make sure that we are live. And I will send out a couple of notifications here. Uh, so just give me a second to do that. All right, and I think we're good to go. All right. So, um, welcome to the stream. Uh, this is technically my second stream here, but uh, I'm treating it as the first because the first one, um, I didn't realize uh, that you had to manually toggle on the uh, VOD feature in order for the stream to actually be saved. So it unfortunately just kind of didn't get saved and got lost in the ether. So um, for those of you who are uh, new to this channel, which is pretty much gonna be everybody, um, I actually have a YouTube channel with about 9,000 subscribers or so um, talking about uh, game development in general um, using you know somewhat uh, newer technology um, and that's kind of mixed with a little bit of old school uh, methodologies of development so uh, what we do on that channel primarily right now um, there's been lots of things that I do on that channel but uh, basically what we do is uh, right now I'm in the process of writing a game engine using C but also using Vulkan uh, as it's rendering uh, backend and uh, the game engine project is called Kohi. And um, it's been uh, in process for about, uh, I wanna say about a year and a half um, at the moment. So uh, on my YouTube channel, there's about 80 or so videos that have been published, uh, a little bit more than that, I think, actually. Um, and we have you know, sort of bootstrapped our engine, have our uh, very basic renderer up and running, some of our um, systems within uh, that actually up and running. And, uh, what I decided to do was to tackle things a little bit differently this year. So um, this being a new year, I'm going to try out a few new things on the channel. Um, and one of those things is I'm actually going to uh, change up the way that I currently uh, handle these videos. So um, up to now, I have sort of gone through a preparation type of stage where I do a lot of the coding in advance and um, prepare sort of features of the engine uh, one at a time. And then I will go through a recording process where I record those things and I will go ahead and after that, I will, um, I'll go ahead and uh, edit that video and uh, finally uh, schedule it to be posted on YouTube. And so far that's worked out pretty well. Um, although at times it kind of takes away a little bit from the project itself, I feel like. so. Um, all that time that I spent sort of preparing videos and, and recording and, and editing and things like that um, was starting to um, reduce the amount of things I was accomplishing on the engine. It was kind of just making it a little bit more um, work to move forward on the engine than, than um, I would prefer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try something a little bit different this year. Um, and if it doesn't work, uh, I'll try something else. Uh, that's another thing that I've done on my channel a lot is experiment with a lot of different things. Um, and so what we're going to try this year is we are going to instead uh, live stream the development of the engine going forward. Um, so I'm not going to do any preparation ahead of time except maybe gather some general thoughts and ideas on what I want to do next. Um, but we're going to live stream the actual development of the engine going forward. Uh, and then what we're going to do is uh, after that live stream is complete, we're going to uh, archive those live streams as episodes on the YouTube channel. And then at some point, uh, I am also going to be doing uh, a series of devlogs and or highlights to uh, sort of capture the highlights out of those live streams and various episodes of uh, Kohi development. And um, we're going to post those on the YouTube channel as well. So it's kind of a multifaceted thing that we've got going on here. Um, and that's the way that I'm going to handle this, at least for a little bit going forward. We're gonna try it, see how it works. If it doesn't work, we'll try something else. So uh, one of the first things that I wanted to do before we actually jump into any development this year though, is take a minute and take a step back. Um, we've done, as I said, uh, over 80 videos now. Um, and I wanna take a look at our uh, roadmap that we have here. Um, and uh, this is actually something that I've edited um, sometime uh, recently, uh, technically in the last live stream that that didn't wind up getting saved. So I'm just gonna kind of 
quickly walk through um, what we have left in this roadmap um, and uh, some of the things that we've completed um, so far. So uh, for those of you that don't know um, how to get to the actual roadmap itself, um, you can actually go to uh, the project itself, uh, which is on GitHub. So it's just github.com forward slash Travis Roman forward slash Kohi. Uh, this is also available on koheengine.com. So there's actually a website uh, dedicated to this as well, uh, where you can find all the links and resources for that, um, such as a forum uh, that has been set up and uh, also uh, auto-generated API documentation that gets uh, updated anytime I push an update to the uh, main branch of code. So we've got uh, all of our data structures and things like that in here. Um, and so um, you can go in here. Some of this stuff isn't documented out yet or isn't commented out yet. That's another thing I'm working on. But um, for an overall view um, or, or a searchable database, uh, so to speak, um, we actually have uh, this here. So you can actually see the source files itself and all that. So um, anyway, uh, from the uh, Kohi engine, um, you uh, would basically go to, uh, you could come down here and go to contribute on GitHub and that'll take you to the project as well. Uh, and then you can go into the wiki itself. And uh, on the wiki, uh, we've got some basic information here on the front page. Uh, I'm gonna do a little bit better this year on trying to keep this updated. Um, but if we come down a little bit further, uh, we have a roadmap all the way down here at the end uh, of this page. And so if you click into that, you can see the same page that I'm looking at here. So um, the idea here is that uh, we are going to um, split this out into a few categories. So we've got engine general, um, which is just uh, things that aren't related to any specific part of the engine. Um, they're just kind of general things that need to happen in the engine. Uh, we also have renderer specific. So these are highly targeted to the renderer itself. And then we actually have UI because UI is such a massive part of um, a game engine and the development effort that goes behind that, that it sort of deserves uh, its own category. And as you can see, we've got a lot of things here. We have some other items here, and then we also have a list of done and implemented features here at the bottom. So uh, as we go through uh, this year, I want to kind of uh, start keeping track and using this a little bit more um, to keep track of what we've done and what we need to do still. Um, and then this will be uh, highly visible so that you guys can kind of see the same thing that I'm looking at uh, very easily. So um, in general, uh, we have, in fact, uh, let's actually go, let's start with the completed bit first um, so that you guys can kind of get a snapshot of where we are in the project so far. So uh, we have a clock system, an event system. Uh, we have our platform layer done. We have cross-platform support. So we support the three major um, Desktop environments here, uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac. And actually, uh, this says Mac is unofficial. That is actually wrong. So I need to already update this. Uh, so the Mac support is actually official now. Um, we actually added that uh, recently. So let me just change this to Mac OS. And that is, uh, that is actually official. So um, we support these uh, three major desktop environments. Uh, right now as is officially. So um, the Mac OS happened, I think, um, a couple months ago, I wanna say. Um, and so we actually uh, have that going now. Now we don't have uh, mobile support yet, but that's coming. Uh, we have a basic testing framework in place so that we can execute and write unit tests for things like our math library or uh, any new containers that we develop, things of that nature. Um, we're not using this as much as I would like for right now, but uh, it does give me a quick way to be able to test uh, various units of code without actually having to launch up the whole engine and launch some specific feature and go into that and load all that stuff up. Um, so it's a, it's a nice uh, framework that we have set up for that. Uh, we have our own math library. So it's our vector math, our matrix math, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so uh, that is, uh, at least the baseline version of that is completed. We'll add to it as needed. We have a hash table, uh, we have uh, free lists. Uh, plus the use of them in buffers. Um, and so this means that our, um, our buffers that we have, uh, namely for our renderer, will actually keep track of allocations on their own and can manage that. We don't have to do it externally. So it's all sort of encapsulated. Uh, so the next thing, uh, we have uh, input for desktop handled. So that's mouse and keyboard input. We have, we have that solved. Um, we have a linear allocator and a dynamic allocator. So these are directly used with uh, the free lists, more so the dynamic allocator itself. 
So all of our allocations within uh, the system are handled by our custom allocator, which is basically just a large arena of memory that we allocate from. We have a resource system set up. So we have uh, loaders for um, just raw binary files, um, text, image, uh, materials, bitmap fonts, and system fonts. So those are the ones we have done. We have a renderer front end back end architecture. So uh, the scaffolding for that has been done. Um, and what, what that basically means is that uh, the back end of the renderer is the render API ex uh, specific stuff. So Vulkan specific or DirectX specific or OpenGL. And the front end are the uh, things that take place sort of um, abstracted away from that. So uh, when we're talking about a renderer texture, uh, render will texture rather, um, it might mean something different in Vulkan than it does uh, in OpenGL. And so uh, the front end allows us to um, you know, configure the renderer in such a way where uh, we don't have to worry about what's going on in the back end to actually be able to uh, set up you know, our renderer pipeline, things like that. Um, so we have our Vulkan back end support uh, in place. Uh, we have the ability to load textures, geometry, uh, materials. These are basic materials for now. So it's the Fong lighting model is what we're using right now. Um, that's a very temporary thing uh, because part of what I'm doing with this engine is it's supposed to be sort of um, educational. So we're going to start with a very basic lighting model like Fong, and we're eventually going to implement uh, physically based rendering or PBR. Um, and so right now we support Fong. Uh, we have spec maps. We have normal map support. Um, we have official Mac support, which I guess that's redundant uh, from up here, but whatever. Um, we have a job system. So that allows us to use uh, threads to sort of offload um, work that needs to be done to a different thread than our, our main thread. So for example, loading complex geometry files or things from disk, um, we can actually spin that off to a different thread and say, hey, just let us know when you're done loading this thing and then we'll feed it to the GPU. Uh, we have skyboxes, uh, we have uh, renderable texture support, uh, multiple render pass support and the configuration of those render passes. So it's configurable. Um, we we do have a little bit more work to do on that, but I'm calling it done right now because um, we can technically uh, configure it through code. So eventually I wanna make it uh, configurable via file so that we could just have a configuration file and read that in instead of having to change code, but we're basically one step behind that. Um, and then so far uh, we have uh, some UI controls in progress. We have a single um, text control that is capable of rendering system and bitmap fonts. So system and bitmap fonts uh, vary in that uh, a bitmap font is basically a single image uh, that you have and you pick pieces out of that uh, image to render text on the screen. So that image will have, you know, A through Z, uh, zero through um, through nine on it, etc. And you basically just pick squares out of that and render, the, render that to the screen. So um, that's a bitmap font. And then system fonts are actually something that loads up like a true type font um, and uses the data in that to generate uh, the font glyphs and then uh, subsequently render those things. So we actually have uh, that set up too. Um, and in addition to that, we also have uh, UTF-8 support. So we can, uh, we can render uh, like Chinese, Japanese, Korean fonts, um, and that is all working. Um, and so uh, that is, is pretty awesome. Uh, one thing that we don't support uh, at the moment is uh, right to left languages or script fonts. Um, so Arabic mainly comes to mind. Uh, that is something that I do want to tackle, but I don't know Arabic. So it's a little bit hard for me to test and verify. So uh, at some point I'll find a way around that. But um, for now we don't have support for that, but um, I do intend on adding it at some point. We also have uh, auto generated code documentation. I've already kind of shown you that. Um, this does require that the entire code base be gone over and commented. So um, at some point, I'm going to break down and do that, but that's kind of a monolithic task, and I don't really want to do that on stream or video. So sometime when I'm maybe sitting in an airport or um, some somewhere where I can't really be doing anything else, I'll probably um, dig into that a little bit. Okay, so that is everything that we have done so far. So um, I'm just gonna kind of hit the, uh, the high points of uh, the engine general stuff that we need to put in place. So um, we have uh, in-game um, object unloading that we need to handle. So right now we can load up uh, complex scenes and meshes and things like that, uh, but we actually have no way to unload it. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because uh, the loading of all that stuff is sort of 
um, very rigid and hard coded at the moment. Um, and so uh, we actually need to have uh, scenes, which we're going to come to here in a little bit. Um, we need mobile runtime support. So um, I'm going to be supporting Android and iOS as well, uh, but as runtime only targets, meaning the editor uh, facilities will not be available on there, but we can um, generate games for that particular target, uh, but we will not uh, be obviously supporting an editor because it doesn't really make sense, I don't think, to be able to edit um, you know, on a phone. Uh, if that changes, you know, we could always uh, revisit that in the future. I don't think it's really going to be too, too crazy other, with, other than a bunch of complicated UI work, um, but for now, I'm not going to support that. Uh, we need Sim, SIMD support, so that's uh, single instruction, multiple data. Um, that is predominantly for the math library. Um, it's just something I haven't gotten around to doing yet. Um, it's an optimization um, and a good one at that, but uh, it's just something that I haven't had um, time to visit yet simply because we have too much else to do at the moment. Um, so dynamic arrays are something we have. Um, we have uh, something in the system called D-arrays, uh, and uh, that works decently, but it's got a few problems. So I actually want to write a, an alternate uh, version of that and um, a version of it that is... Um, that works a little bit differently than what we have right now. Something that's a little bit more easily uh, unit testable and verifiable in the way that it works. So um, I have this marked as a to-do because I wanna revisit it, um, not because we don't have it, but because I'd like to um, essentially deprecate the old version of it and create something that's a little bit better. Um, we also need to add uh, a couple more containers. So we need a stack, a queue, a ring, a pool, and a binary uh, search tree. Um, those are some of the basic ones I could think of off the top of my head that we're eventually gonna need. Uh, so the logger in here, um, we already do have a logging system, uh, but I've marked this as to do because I want to multi-thread it. Um, and I also want to support multiple channels of logging so that way we can sort of split things out like this came from the renderer or this came from the job system or what have you. Um, and then that way we can sort of reconcile that maybe in a database at some point in the future um, where we can sort of filter those things out. And so uh, the logger still has some work to do um, and that's mostly what uh, is around that. Uh, we also need particle support. Um, some of these are pretty high level items as you might've guessed. We need uh, mobile input and then gamepad support input. So that's like an Xbox or a, a PS5 controller or something like that. Um, we need a, uh, a string library and we already have a string library that handles uh, C strings, but uh, I want to create a, what's called a K string um, structure that uh, is, it kind of automates some of the handling of strings for us, uh, similar to what the uh, standard libraries do for C++, um, but something that's a little bit more lightweight. And so um, that is something that I want to get tackled uh, sooner rather than later for sure. Um, we also need a pool allocator um, because uh, there are several instances where that is going to be super, super useful, um, especially when we get uh, to creating our ECS down here. Um, so we need a systems manager um, because right now um, we have uh, a sort of an ad hoc uh, interface for managing all of our various systems. And when I say system, um, we have like our... Um, our uh, input system, we have the um, event system, the logging system, all these various systems. And those all should really conform to some, um, like an I system interface almost uh, that we create. Um, and then all of those things should be registered with a central like system manager um, that is responsible for doling out updates and uh, managing the life cycle of those things, things like that. And right now, um, all of that is actually sitting in our application um, file, I guess you could call it. It's not really a class or anything like that, but it's it's um, it's sort of this application. Um, yeah, it's just an application code unit, I guess you could call it. And that's kind of what's packaging everything. Um, and speaking of that, that's actually something that uh, I think we probably ought to rename at some point as well. So um, our... Our application really is our engine. Um, so the application.c that we have, in fact, let me open up project here and go to application, show you guys what I'm talking about. So we have this application uh, C file here, and this guy has all the 
memory and um, memory requirements uh, for the states of all the various systems. Uh, this kind of manages everything, right? This is sort of the entry point um, for the engine and whatnot. And then the, um, the confusingly application uh, is, is basically what uh, consumes this. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm saying we probably ought to rename this. So I think I'm gonna re wind up renaming this application.c to engine.c um, and change all these function signatures to uh, engine instead because our application is really, um, like our test bed is an example of an application. That is really an application, not this. So um, we're gonna have um, our test bed application and eventually we're gonna have other applications that come into play here, like our editor application. Um, and eventually a game application. And so this application uh, naming here doesn't really make sense. So I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna be renaming this uh, at some point to engine. Anyway, uh, let's see, where were we? So that is the systems manager, uh, the resource system. Um, so uh, I only marked this as to do because there is one more loader that I'm gonna have to write, which is for scenes. Um, and this is kind of what I was talking about here about the um, in-game object unloading. Uh, that is going to go hand in hand with this. Uh, we need a binary file format for textures uh, with a converter. So uh, we're already doing this for meshes. We just haven't done it for textures yet. That's basically going to um, read and write textures in a format that the engine understands. So we can read that in as a binary blob just all at once. We don't have to worry about any decoding or anything like that for textures. It'll make loading uh, much faster. Uh, let's see, so resource hot load is another thing we want to put in place. Uh, ECS, so an editing component system, uh, that is something that I want to put in place. But um, I want to put it in place in such a manner that it is not actually required to use it. So one of the um, one of the issues that I find with a lot of the big box uh, engines is they sort of uh, shoehorn you into uh, a specific workflow with, uh, especially when it comes to entity component systems. Um, you know, Unity has its its own sort of special thing that it that it does with that, and um, it's not always ideal for every project. Some projects are really simple enough; they don't need all of that extra logic and overhead to actually be able to perform the tasks they need to perform. And so, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to supply an ECS, but we're not going to require that it actually be used. Um, and so, uh, when we go to write out our scene and level. Um, we'll basically have an ECS version of that and a non-ECS version of that. Um, and so uh, our scene level, um, we don't actually have that concept right now. We're just kind of loading meshes and textures and things um, directly uh, in, in the game as it is, um, sort of in line, and that's obviously not ideal. So uh, with that comes a file format load and save functionality. Um, so all of that is kind of tied together. Uh, we'll need a concept of prefabs, which is basically um, whenever you load uh, a series of resources like meshes or um, materials or eventually skeletal, skeletal meshes, um, we'll, we'll be able to sort of combine a few of those together. Maybe other um, types of, of uh, components as well, like lights, for example, and be able to combine those together and um, uniformly refer to that one thing as a prefab and then be able to um, regenerate multiple copies of that. Um, so that's what we're talking about with prefabs. Ray casting is something we're definitely going to need. Um, object picking, we're about half done with this. So we actually have. Uh, pixel perfect object picking where we take anything uh, out of uh, our scene and our UI that we say should be um, rendered for a specific special render pass um, for object picking. And basically what we do is we take the, um, the object's unique identifier, which is a number, and we convert that to an RGB value and we draw each object in the scene uh, using that RGB value only, no lighting, no shading, no nothing like that. Um, and then what we do is the mouse position when it hovers over that uh, thing in the scene, uh, we can take that RGB value, convert it back to an integer, have an object ID and say, hey, this is the ID of the object we're currently hovering over, uh, if there is one. And so we have uh, that complete, um, but we don't have the sort of physics-based um, version of that where you uh, take a uh, the 
position uh, that you click on a screen and you project that into 3D and you say, hey, what, um, what are the objects that are um, below the mouse that I've clicked on here? And so that's why I say that's half done because there's, uh, there's reasons to have both. Uh, let's see, so uh, Gizmos. Uh, so Gizmo is basically an editor Gizmo. Uh, this might fall under UI, but also it's kind of a scene thing as well. Um, and I say that because this is, uh, like if you've ever used uh, Maya, 3D Studio Max, something like that, um, it's when you select an object in the scene and then you have the ability to translate that or uh, rotate it or scale it. Um, that's what the Gizmo actually is. It's that little tool that shows up um, in the environment that allows you to manipulate objects like that. So we need one of those. Uh, we need audio, we need physics. Uh, those are in caps because those are big features all on their own. Um, networking I have here with a question mark because I don't know, um, at least in the short term, if I'm gonna support networking because that is sort of a beast on its own. Um, and so for the first version of this engine, we may not support this at all. I have that there with a question mark because I haven't decided that yet. Um, we want to do a little bit more work in profiling so that we can uh, get a snapshot of different uh, parts of the loop cycle in the engine to determine you know, what's taking the most time out of a, a single frame uh, in the engine, um, as well as some other profiling um, utilities that we want to write. So we need to write some utilities um, to support all of that. Uh, we want a proper editor and runtime uh, libraries. So I have here replace testbed. Um, it's really not going to be a replacing testbed. It's going to be kind of alongside of it. So the testbed um, is our sort of application that we have uh, within uh, the game project right now to allow us to test new features uh, whenever we add them. And so um, it's just a quick way for us to be able to uh, go in there and add something without having to go through menus and all that stuff um, in a game that might be worked on, um, currently worked on, for example. Uh, so in that, we're going to have a world editor where you can go in and um, edit various scenes and uh, set things up and um, manage all of the, the various components of that. Uh, we'll have a UI editor so you can set up various uh, game screens and things like that, UI controls. Uh, and then we'll have a game editor uh, logic library. So um, this is like a, a DLL or share object. We want to be able to hot reload those. Um, and so that is basically going to be uh, what keeps us from having to write a scripting system um, is because we want the ability to be able to compile um, the editor logic library or the game logic library and uh, have that reload, hot reload on the fly whenever we generate a new one. So um, if our math is a little bit off on something or um, we're tweaking a property, we can just uh, tweak that in the code, recompile it while the game engine is running um, and then it will pick up that a new file has been written and it will um, reinitialize using that DLL. So that is something that we do want to uh, set up sometime in the very near future. Key maps and key bindings. Uh, this is something that uh, we are going to need here very shortly for the next couple of features that we have uh, in the list here. So uh, key maps are basically um, a mapping of key bindings. So when I say key binding, um, it's like what happens when you press the A keyboard um, and it'll allow you to tie a function to that particular event. Um, so when you press the A key, um, there'll be a separate binding for um, press, we'll have a separate binding for release, and then we'll have an another binding yet for when you hold the key. Um, and so what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to layer those key maps um, full of key bindings, one on top of the other. Um, and that's actually one thing that we're going to be discussing in this stream here today. Uh, so uh, we also are going to have uh, a system of KVARs, and these are sort of globally configurable variables. Um, and those are going to be something that we can use to change settings real quickly during runtime uh, in the system without having to recompile. Um, so it'll be like changing uh, resolution might be of a, uh, eventually tied to this, or changing level of detail, or... Um, uh, whether or not vSync is enabled, things like that. Um, so uh, we'll eventually uh, be having a, a system here for KVARs for that. That's actually going to be sometime soon. Um, we're also going to have a console slash console consumer system. So a console system is going to be a, the central system that uh, the engine is going to have that uh, not only handles uh, logging output, but also allows the interpretation of commands that are going to be input into a developer console that we're going to implement into the engine. And so uh, what that's basically going to be is if you've ever played like uh, Quake, for example, uh, and you hit the tilde key and you've got this little drop down menu that comes, 
and it shows you all the previous logging entries, but you can also enter some text in there um, and set KVARs, um, or you can set um, or execute various commands that have been registered with the console system. So that's what that's gonna be. Um, and we're gonna have a UI component that sort of goes along with that, um, that we're gonna call the debug console um, to uh, be able to use uh, alongside that. And the console consumer is basically gonna be uh, anytime we have logging written to the console or anything written to the console, we're gonna have uh, these console consumers that take that input and do something with it. So uh, an example of that is the uh, debug console is gonna keep a copy of all of that logging output and allow you to scroll through it. Um, another example of a console consumer might be, we'll have like a, uh, a log file console consumer. So right now it's just kind of hard coded um, in the logger itself that it writes out to a file. We don't wanna be doing that because that's, that's slow. It's, we're doing it in line, right? And so another console consumer that we're gonna do is we're going to set up a, like a file uh, console consumer that will queue up a bunch of those entries and then just write them to a file on another thread so that we're not holding up the main thread um, in doing all of that. And that'll utilize the job system that we already have in place to do that. So um, that is what that is. Uh, I've already kind of covered console commands. Um, application configuration, uh, this is eventually gonna be something that we're just gonna be able to read um, like a human readable file and use that to set up um, various aspects of the application when it boots up. So that might be like default resolution, default level of detail, whether vSync is on, things like that. Um, and we'll be able to uh, read that in and then set those things. Uh, we're gonna have a timeline system. So this is going to be uh, something that allows us to um, set uh, callbacks to be made after a certain amount of time or uh, present a, a timeline um, and say, tween the state of, um, of some object between you know, state A and state B over a given amount of time, say two seconds or something like that. And so um, a timeline system is something that we're definitely gonna need for a lot of stuff. Um, tweens is gonna be one of them. A skeletal animation system is gonna be another one, um, things like that. So we're gonna, be, uh, we're gonna wind up using this a lot once we get it in place. Uh, and then we also want to implement a terrain system and uh, a sky sphere. So now we have a sky box, we also want a sky sphere, which is gonna have a little bit uh, different functionality from that. Uh, in terms of our renderer, uh, we are going to be supporting Open uh, DirectX, OpenGL, and Metal. And I have Metal as a question mark here because uh, we do support Mac OS uh, right now using Vulkan uh, and uh, Molten VK which basically takes uh, Vulkan commands and uh, translates them into Metal commands and uh, sends them on through. So that's what we're doing on macOS right now. So Metal support isn't required right away, but eventually I do want to support that. Um, and so those are the backends that we're gonna be supporting for the renderer. Um, I want to improve our geometry generation a little bit. So uh, the generation of 2D and 3D shapes. So right now we do have a cube, but like generate a cylinder, a cone, um, a torus, not things like that, um, just for the ability to be able to test uh, various items. Um, and eventually this will probably extend into like a uh, constructive solid geometry type of thing where we can use that to block out levels and things of that nature. Um, and so one thing that's gonna immediately use this is our gizmo uh, because the gizmo has um, various pieces of geometry that it actually needs to represent it in the world. Um, so like your arrow on each one of the axes consists of a cylinder with a cone at the end. Um, and so uh, we're gonna use that uh, for that right off the bat. So that's another thing we're gonna be adding. We want advanced materials. Um, so this is uh, not only materials that have static properties, but materials that can have uh, various values tweened over time. So we can have animated materials and materials that uh, react to certain events and things like that. So advanced materials is something we want to put in place. Uh, obviously, we're going to have PBR support at some point. Um, we want multi-threading support from the renderer perspective. So obviously, OpenGL isn't really friendly with this, but uh, Direct3D12 uh, and Vulkan certainly are. And so we want to uh, leverage the multi-threading uh, job system we already have to also be able to throw things at the GPU from multiple threads like loading up textures or mesh data or what, what have you. We also want to support batch rendering and this is both for 2D and 3D uh, pipelines. So uh, that should speed things up, reduce the amount of uh, draw calls that we have, etc. Uh, and then shadow maps. So obviously this is not an exhaustive list. We're going to be adding way more than this, but these are sort of the things that I want to hit um, 
coming up this year. I'm thinking we could probably hit a lot of this this year. Not all of it for sure, but. Um, and last, I'll quickly cover uh, the UI. So uh, we are going to set up a UI system. Uh, that's going to support layering, so we can have multiple layers of UI. So if you think of a Photoshop document, you can um, have groups of uh, UI controls that are on different layers. That'll help determine how they're sorted uh, in front of one another and, and things like that, um, as well as give us the power to you know uh, hide and, and show. Uh, Obviously, that means we need some sort of format to be able to hold all this UI information. Once we've configured it, we need some way to write that down to a file and save it, um, which goes into loading and saving UIs. Uh, UI editor comes with that. Um, control focus, uh, tab order. So this is, if you think about using a web browser um, and you've got multiple um, text boxes on a screen, radio buttons, check boxes, things like that, as you tab or hit the tab key on your keyboard, it sort of cycles through those controls in a certain order. So this would be uh, the ability to have focus on a particular control to be able to enter text into a text box, for example, um, and then also be able to tab through those controls in an order that you define. We're going to have uh, docking support. And, um, so that's basically the ability to take uh, windows and dock them to like one side of, or the other of the screen, um, things like that. Drag and drop support. Uh, that's going to be not only within the engine, but also for dragging and dropping files uh, or assets um, onto the, the editor window. So we need to support that as well. And then um, a non-exhaustive uh, list of UI controls here. Um, so uh, we have sort of a, this is gonna be one of the places or one of the few places where we're actually gonna use object-oriented programming and inheritance. So, um, most things I don't think need this, but I feel like this is one of the areas where it kind of does make sense. So we're going to have a base control um, that sort of uh, provides the basic level of functionality for all UI controls. So for example, all UI controls need the ability to show and hide themselves. Um, all UI controls need the ability to have uh, children objects as well as parent objects for hierarchy, um, things like that. And then we're going to have uh, basically a blank panel, so that can have like a solid or transparent color um, background to it, uh, just to sort of separate it from everything behind it. Uh, we'll have a image box where we can literally just put um, some sort of texture behind it um, and uh, be able to load a particular image. We're going to have something called a viewport control, which is going to be a um, essentially an image box uh, with a render target as its texture, um, and then that render target is going to be uh, what we will generate um, our world and our scenes um, and we'll, we'll write to those essentially. And what that'll allow us to do is have uh, multiple viewports on the screen. So like an, in an editor, you might want to have um, one view where you, you've got the fully lit sort of rendered scene and then you might have another view um, that has uh, maybe an orthographic wireframe perspective and then you might have another view that has you know some other perspective. Uh, maybe lighting only or something like that. And so this will give us that functionality. Uh, text control, so system and bitmap font. This is actually not to do, that's actually already done. We already have that. Um, we're gonna have a rich text control. So this is basically gonna be just system text with multicolor, bold italic, um, things like that. Um, and then um, it can also, I th I'm thinking, I might not actually do this, but I'm thinking just bitmap text with multicolor only with no um, bold italic uh, support. So. I'd, that last bit is sort of questionable. I don't know if I'm gonna do that or not, or, or uh, keep just bitmap text to just be the standard um, text control, we'll see. Um, but this will allow us to have, um, you know, very rich uh, text uh, um, controls on the screen. Uh, we're also gonna have your basic button, your basic checkbox, your radio buttons that could be grouped together so that only one of them could be selected, that type of thing. Um, we'll have a tab control so you can have sort of a panel with little tabs across the top Similar to this, where if you toggle back and forth, you see um, the elements within that tab. We'll have uh, windows and, um, and modals. So uh, that kind of goes hand in hand with docking. Um, so we'll have resize, min, max, or store, open, close, et cetera, for those windows. Uh, we'll have um, resizable multi-panels. So um, that's basically, uh, if you see, an, uh, well, I think actually a good example of that is Visual Studio. So. Um, I would consider this whole thing a multi-panel where you can sort of drag um, and resize the individual panels um, using a slider here, and you can do that. Um, 
obviously a scroll bar and scroll container, that's gonna be super important to have because there's gonna be a lot of things where the content overflows the physical space we have on the screen. We need a way to, to actually handle that. Um, we have a text box and a text area. So this is basically gonna be, um, they're, they're essentially the same control. Um, it's just the text area is sort of a multi-line text box, essentially, um, where the user can enter in text in it um, or paste text from uh, the clipboard, things like that. Uh, and then an in-game um, debug console, which we've already talked about is that drop-down console. Um, when you hit tilde, it comes down. Um, so other items, uh, I'm hoping to flush out some documentation uh, this year. Um, but that's really the only big one I have, um, at least for right now. So this is kind of what our, our roadmap looks like for right now um, for uh, this next year. This is what we're going to be working from. Uh, I may think of some new things to add to this. Uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But um, I guess we'll, we'll sort of take it ad hoc as, as we go. Um, one thing, let me just change down here because I think I still had something in here. This was marked as to do, that's done. So let me get that out of there. Okay, so um, like I was saying earlier, we are gonna be changing the way that uh, we actually handle, um, that we handle uh, the development of this engine in terms of, I'm going to be uh, live streaming the, the uh, development of it and no longer sort of um, going through and, and doing the preparation ahead of time. Um, that is with the exception of this video because um, I made this decision to try this um, after I actually had already done a bunch of prep work for the next couple of features. So um, what we're gonna do in this stream and probably the next one um, is we are going to go through the features that I've added. So um, what we basically have here is, let me go ahead and just clean and rebuild. I don't know why this takes so much longer on Windows than it does on Linux. All right, so we'll go ahead and run this guy. So that way you all can see what we have so far. All right, so let me uh, let me move this over here so that you guys can actually see that. Cool, um, so what we have right now is uh, just this basic scene for any of those of you who are, are, are new to this. We have just this basic scene with some transparent cubes rotating around in a circle. Um, and if we hit, um, L on the keyboard, we go ahead and we load up a test spawns a scene. Uh, and this, um, this scene also has sort of this um, temporary car model that we're using here is something that's a little bit more higher detail. Um, and so you can see here that we've got, you know, our specular lighting, our normal mapping and stuff um, all working. And we also have, um, you know, our debug modes where we can see just the lighting. Um, we can see just the normals um, and things like that. And so, um, the first thing that I wanted to point out is uh, I've made a couple of small changes um, in here. So uh, at the bottom here, uh, we can see that we have uh, an update timer and uh, it's a little hard to read, but there's a renderer timer. So I probably need to fix that so it doesn't bounce around so much. Um, so that is how long the update takes and how long the render takes. Um, uh, and so we'll go into that. Uh, we have this vsync yes. So right now you'll notice that uh, vsync is turned on by default. Um, this was not here before. This is something that I've added. Um, it was a relatively simple feature to add, so we'll go ahead and cover that. Uh, but I wanted the ability to turn that on and off. So um, what I can do is just hit V on the keyboard to turn that off, and then you'll notice our frame rate jumps up a little bit, right? Um, and if I hit V again to turn it back on, it goes right back to 60, uh, 60, 61, right? And so uh, this is just a running average FPS and frame time, so it's, um, it's just taking that average over, I think, 30 frames at a time. And so um, I just added these um, for a little bit of uh, debugability, if you were, because when we change from um, vSync to um, to uh, no vSync, you know, we shouldn't see any sort of um, weird uh, changes in in the timing of how this stuff rotates and whatnot. So if I turn vSync off, you'll notice that this still handles it fine, even though our frame rate has gone up. So we know all that's working. Uh, but we always are going to want the ability to check that. So we um, want to be able to 
turn that on and off at will. Now, the other thing that I've added, and it's gonna be a little bit hard to see, unfortunately, because of this Kohi thing, I need to remove that, is if I add, um, or if I go ahead and hit the tilde, you'll note that we actually have uh, output here from the log. So we're logging 10 lines. So we already have our, um, our debug console uh, actually implemented here. And if I hit uh, up or down while this is open, um, I can actually scroll through the list of all the logging entries. The other thing that I can do is I can enter some text. So if I can just enter some text there, um, you'll notice that as I type on the keyboard, uh, that shows up. And if I hit enter, it's going to actually try and execute that. In this case, it's saying that command doesn't exist because it doesn't. But what it allows me to do is I can actually take something that does exist, for example, exit, and it exits the application. Now, uh, we do have some errors here, and I think I know what's causing that, but we'll come back to that. So um, we've implemented uh, several different features here, and like I said, I did a lot of this prep ahead of time. So what I'm going to do is um, sort of step through uh, a little bit of that now, um, and we'll see how far we get. And then um, once we, um, you know, we, we may have to split that into two streams, I'm not sure. Um, but then after we've uh, gone over all of that, um, we will be doing uh, all of the coding for this uh, live, unless there's something that's really stupid like uh, commenting or something like that. And then I'll just do that off camera and mention it. Okay, um, so uh, I guess uh, probably the best place to start is actually gonna be the renderer. So um, one of the things that we've done is um, in the renderer itself is, um, in fact, actually, let me go to, whoops, the renderer front end. So um, one of the things that we've done is we've sort of revamped this uh, renderer backend config a little bit. And we've gone ahead and uh, in addition to the application name, we actually have this render config flags. So I'm gonna go ahead and look at the definition for that real quick. And we have a couple type, type defs here. So we have this render config flag bits where we can uh, set various flags uh, for the renderer backend on creation. So uh, in this case, we have uh, vsync enabled, um, and then we also have power saving. Uh, and this is basically to indicate to the renderer, um, A, do we want vsync on or off? And then B, do we want to do anything that we can within the renderer backend to um, invoke power saving? Um, and one of those things is, you know, that's really gonna be important um, when we go to, to do um, the renderer uh, for mobile, right? Because mobile runtime, uh, you don't want to be eating up the battery. And so um, power saving is actually pretty important. So uh, we have the ability to uh, combine these flags into a new type def here that I have, which is renderer config flags. And um, that's just a U32. So I can just order those flags together. And then um, we have that passed here in the config. So what I have done is uh, I actually set uh, the uh, flags here, I've turned on vsync enabled by default. Now this is just hard coded, right? So we have a to do here to say expose this to the application to be able to configure it. Um, but for right now, I've just sort of hard coded this in place with a to do so we come back to it. So I've turned on vsync enable and power saving. And um, that will uh, make sense when we actually uh, take a look at what happens. So this calls backend initialize, right? So if we go to our um, Vulkan, back, oops, back end. And we go to initialize. Oops, that's the wrong initialize, that's shader initialize. Uh, this one here. Um, so we have our render config that gets passed in. Um, and you'll note that uh, we don't really do too, too much with it um, at this level. Um, we do use the application name out of that. Uh, and then uh, a little bit further down, When we go to create our swap chain, we pass the config flags. So right now the swap chain is actually the only thing uh, that is using those flags, but that's not gonna be true um, soon. So if we go to Vulkan swap chain create, uh, we'll notice that that uh, flag is here. The flags are here that gets passed through to our local create function. And this uh, basically has a direct influence on the present mode that's used. Um, and these two flags actually both um, uh, change what present mode we're actually using. So uh, 
First thing we do is we set uh, a copy of these flags on the swap chain, uh, because when we need to regenerate the swap chain, we don't want to change those settings. Uh, we want to keep the settings that were last set. And then um, if uh, we have the vsync enabled bit set, uh, then we try to come through here and we say, all right, we're first going to start with uh, FIFO, which is guarantee guaranteed to be supported by all implementations per the Vulkan spec. Then uh, we go through here and we say, well, um, if we do not have power saving uh, turned on, then we're going to try for mailbox mode. And so we'll search through all of the various support modes, or supported present modes rather, and check to see if mailbox is supported, and if it is, use it. Uh, if power saving is turned on, it does not do this. So why is that? Uh, that is because mailbox basically generates frames as fast as it possibly can, but only uses the most current frame when it comes time to present, which means there's a lot of work that gets thrown away. And on a desktop, this is fine because it reduces input lag, right? You're always going to be using the most um, up-to-date frame, which is fine. Uh, but on mobile, that's really bad because you don't want to be doing a bunch of work that you don't have to be doing on mobile because that wastes battery. So we have this power saving thing to say, hey, uh, if we're in power saving mode, we should not be using uh, the present mode um, mailbox for that, okay? So uh, that is if vsync is on. If vsync is off, then we're basically going to just use immediate mode, which is basically gonna say, jam the frame out as soon as we're done um, uh, generating it, just output it. And it's just gonna write them out as fast as it possibly can. And so uh, that is basically uh, the vsync feature um, in a nutshell. So uh, the other half of this, is um, if we go into uh, the game.c and we take a look at the update loop. So we've got this uh, massive string here with our debug text at the bottom. Uh, we have our uh, vsync text that we're getting. So uh, that is basically querying the, the renderer for the vsync flag enabled, right? Um, now, this renderer flag enabled is something new that's been added as well. So all this is basically going to do is it's just a pass through function to say, hey, um, check to see if this flag is enabled. Uh, the set enabled obviously allows us to set a flag and whether or not it's enabled, right? So that's pretty self-explanatory, I feel like. And then the back end will um, we'll do those things accordingly because like, um, power saving might not be available on all back ends um, or uh, the ability to vsync maybe, or some other flag that we have may not be available. So we're leaving that up to the back end as to whether or not that can even be set um, in the first place. All right, uh, so uh, basically all this does is say, hey, uh, is the render flag um, for vsync enabled? Yes or no? And it just basically puts that in line, right? Um, and so it just queries that uh, basically every frame, which again, is not gonna be fast, um, but, uh, you know, I think uh, for a debug testbed application, that's just fine, right? We're not, we're not uh, going to ship this, right? This is something that um, this kind of check is not something that you you would wind up shipping. So I'm I'm okay with that. Um, all right. So the next thing um, is we had some issues here with the timing of this. So I'm going to try and bump this out a couple characters. And I'm gonna rebuild this real quick and see if that helps with the text bouncing around. Cause that's kind of annoying. And does not look like it is. Do I have my formatting wrong here? I might have to. Maybe I have to pad this differently. Might have been, I wonder if I can do this. I can't remember the exact syntax, so we'll see. I don't know if that's right or not. Uh, it's a little better, but it looks like, oh, I think I know what the problem is actually. I should bump out.
fact, I don't really even, let me bump this up by one more. So I'll bump the whole number or the total number, but I won't bump the fractional number display. I think that's probably what I need to do. Let's see if that helps. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So um, we basically needed room here for another digit. So um, we're measuring this in microseconds, which right now this stuff is not fast, right? Um, but we can see here that our update is, is taking uh, substantially longer than the render, which is kind of what we would expect. Um, but uh, if we go ahead and turn VSync off, we'll see that that changes a little bit, right? So um, this is the, the type of tooling that I'm talking about when we, when we talk about uh, we want the ability to um, profile. Um, this will give us a snapshot of how much um, of the current frame is being taken up by various things. Now, obviously a text format like this is not gonna be useful. What we really should have is some sort of graph that shows up on the screen um, that gives us a, a sort of visual percentage of how much of the frame that's actually tying up. Right, um, so our, our, our total frame time is between 16 and 17 milliseconds um, versus, uh, you know, our update, which is, uh, you know, it looks like it's hovering between, I don't know, about 600 to maybe 2000 microseconds. Um, and the render is hovering between, looks like about eight and 12 microseconds. And so we can, we really should have some visual um, representation of that, but, um, for now, we're just gonna use this as is. Anyway, um, so let's also uh, have a look at the, let's see, this rotation here. Um, this is rotation, wait a minute, is that the right one? That's the cube. Where did I set the rotation for the UI? It had to have been here. Uh, here we go. So this is for that Kohi logo. Um, and I'm actually going to, hmm, I'm gonna disable that for right now. Um, and I'm actually just going to change this to transform, translate, um, and the thing we're going to transform is the UI meshes transform. And we are going to move this. Um, let's move that to, I don't know, the other side of the screen. Uh, let's move it 650 pixels. That should be enough out of the way to allow us to see what's going on here. Yeah, okay, so that should be, that's kind of out of the way now um, of our console, right? Long lines are probably still gonna bleed through it, but at least we can kind of read it, right? So um, the next thing I wanna kind of go over a little bit is uh, the way that all of this um, debug console stuff sort of works. So I think I'm gonna start at the debug console itself um, because this is sort of the consumer of everything that we've added. So um, right now, uh, this is sort of set up as a static singleton, which is not great. Um, I eventually am gonna refactor this into sort of a UI control of its own. But for right now, um, I'm just gonna treat it like there's only one of these things. So we have a static state pointer, which is kind of crappy um, for a UI control, but whatever. So um, right now this has uh, a line display count, which is how many lines are displayed on the screen at the time. A line offset. So this is how many lines we've scrolled from the bottom uh, of that list. So uh, whenever we hit the up or down arrows, that, that number will uh, increment or decrement. Then we have a, uh, a D array of um, character pointers or strings, right? So we have an, an array of those things. Those are the individual lines that are in the console. Uh, and then we have uh, whether or not it's dirty and whether or not it's visible. So uh, visible is pretty obvious. Dirty um, is a flag that we set uh, to indicate um, when we need to update the uh, UI text object. So speaking of that, we have two UI text here. We have uh, our text control and we have our entry control. And so the text control is what is going to, uh, is what actually display, oops. 
just bring it up so it's a little bit more obvious. So our text control is uh, what displays all of these lines here. And basically as we update this, we regenerate uh, the, the contents of that text control. And then the uh, entry is actually this guy down here. So it's a separate text control that we um, basically as we type, we, um, we go ahead and uh, update the contents of that. So, um, so the way that this works is um, this is a console consumer. So the, the uh, interface for the console consumer is basically saying uh, we pass some sort of instance object um, that we may or may not use. In this case, we're not actually using it, but um, once we actually have uh, turned this into uh, a non-static version, we'll probably pass the instance of the debug console uh, consumer itself. Um, but uh, we pass the log level and then uh, a message. And the intent with the log level is to basically use that to color code um, all of the messages, but we don't have support for that yet. So we're just gonna have to deal with that. So this message then gets split into individual lines and then uh, each one of those gets added uh, into our lines within our pointer as a separate line. So if we have a multi-line message, um, that will allow us to still scroll through that multi-line message um, one line at a time without um, you know, taking up the whole screen and then some for a single message if it's multi-line. So this splits that. Um, and then uh, what we also do is uh, the string split itself um, actually performs uh, a, where is it? An allocation, here it is. Um, this performs an allocation per uh, split of the string or per element of the string that's being split. And so um, that is something to bear in mind whenever you're using that. Um, there is a, a string cleanup split array, right, that you would normally want to use for that. But we don't want to do that here because uh, we are pushing that to our lines array. So we actually want those lines to move on. And the reason that we're keeping a copy of it is because uh, we don't know what the life cycle of this particular string is. Uh, it could be something that's thrown away immediately afterwards um, or, or freed. And so we can't uh, rely on uh, wherever this string is coming from. We want to take a copy of it. So this uh, string split um, indirectly does that automatically for us uh, because it creates a new allocation for each split. So uh, we then take those and pass that into um, our array. We do, however, destroy the D array um, that's temporarily created for this itself. So this split message here, we do destroy that, but not its contents. And we can only get away with this because its contents are pointers. So those um, are owned by something else. So we don't clean up the contents, we do clean up the D array. So we're not leaking anything here. Uh, technically, when we shut this down, we should probably free these, but for now, I haven't done that because I don't have a shutdown. Uh, okay, so... This uh, debug console has got a lot of code in it, right? Um, that we probably, um, uh, we might step through a lot of it um, here in a bit, but I'm gonna kind of hit the most important parts first. So uh, the very first thing we do is when we create uh, the console, we go ahead and we allocate memory for the state. We set uh, the line count, which right now I'm just hard coding to 10. Again, this should be configurable. Um, the line offset, uh, again, is from the bottom of the list. That um, should always start at zero. Um, we create our lines, um, and then we also uh, default it to false. Um, now, we have a to-do here, um, so we should update uh, the text based on the number of lines uh, displayed and the number of lines offset from the bottom. A UI text object can be used for display for now. I can worry about color in a separate pass. So actually, this isn't even a to-do. This is a note. Um, and this is, instead of uh, can be, this should be is used for now. Um, so that is actually uh, there. So uh, all we do in this case is we allocate memory and set up the, um, the state. And then uh, we register the console consumer. So this is something that we haven't touched yet. Um, but this is the, uh, the console that exists. Um, that we register consumers with, and then that is what sort of doles out the messages. So we'll come back to that in a second. Then we have uh, this separate load process, um, which is designed uh, to be done after, you know, sort of the renderer backend is stood up. Um, 
and we have the ability to load resources. And so um, all this really does is it creates two UI texts. So it creates one for rendering, right? And it saves that off to text control and then sets its position. And then we create another one for the rendering the type text. So that's the entry control um, and then handles its position. So in this case, we're just, um, we're hard coding a font size here for both of these guys to just 31. And then what we're doing for the position is uh, we are setting it uh, three away from the left and then we're setting it 30 pixels down plus the size of the font times the number of lines we're displaying, which is 10. Um, and that will automatically position it sort of at the bottom. It's a hack, um, but you know, it's temporary. Um, this is the kind of stuff we'll do a little bit more often um, when we're first setting things up. And then as we actually uh, get these things more configurable, we'll be able to remove these hacks and actually configure them properly instead. So um, we create those two objects and then we register for some events. So in this case, key uh, pressed and key released are the only events that we're actually interested in. Uh, we're not interested in a key hold event. And then uh, those will uh, go to this debug console on key, which performs key processing. So um, this looks like a lot of logic. Uh, it's not terribly crazy though, to be honest. So uh, basically what this does is uh, it says, okay, if we have a key press, um, that's the only one we're gonna handle right now. Um, key release we might handle um, sometime in the future, but for right now, presses are good enough. Uh, we go ahead and grab the key code, determine whether a shift is held, which based on the backend platform, you need to check left, right, and uh, this key shift, which sometimes can be set on its own. So if any of these are true, then we're considering shift held. And what we're doing, doing right now is we first check for the enter key um, because that is gonna be what's used to actually execute a command or process the text, right? So uh, if we have um, a length um, of our string, like if it's greater than zero, not just an empty string, uh, then we'll go ahead and process that. Otherwise we'll just do nothing and ignore it. Um, and uh, we'll come here and we'll say console execute command uh, and we'll pass through the text here. I have to do here to handle the error. Um, right now, if there is an error with this, it actually is uh, printed out by the console itself, but I may want to handle that additionally here somehow. Um, so this passes that off for, um, for processing. And then uh, it goes ahead and clears out the text for the entry control. So it just sets it back to empty, okay? And so uh, that is the way that works. Um, backspace. Uh, all that does is basically grabs the length of the string and then says, if the length is greater than zero, go ahead and um, take a copy of the string um, and then set the uh, string length minus one to null character. So it basically lops off the last character of the string, sets the text to that, and then frees uh, the string, right? Um, and this is done because we don't, again, know the life cycle. We don't want to... Um, rely on life cycle of that string existing somewhere else. We don't want to have to think about that. It's much easier to just go ahead and uh, duplicate the string, perform our processing on that, set it here, and then free it. Otherwise, um, we're going to use uh, A through Z and near zero through nine um, as is, at least by default. So we're going to say this, and then we'll say if the key code um, is between key A and key Z, we'll check to see if shift uh, is not held. So if, um, if shift is not held, uh, then we're going to take the key code and um, add 32 to it, which will basically make it the lowercase um, version of that. If it is held, uh, then we will go ahead and uh, not do that, which will give us the capital version. Uh, that reminds me to do check caps lock, uh, because caps lock is actually gonna be an issue for that if we don't handle that. So I'll come back to that. Uh, all right, so uh, the next thing is uh, if we are between zero and nine um, and the shift is held, um, there are various keys um, that are actually handled um, on different types of keyboards, right? So this particular um, logic right here only handles US standard layouts. Uh, I need to find a way, and I'm probably gonna have to set up some sort of um, structure to handle this for different types of keyboard layouts um, as to what symbols correspond to which key um, when uh, the shift key is actually held. So um, for example, the zero key on US keyboards um, has a clothing, closing parenthesis, the one key 
um, on uh, American keyboards. Oh, what? wait a minute. Do I actually have this? Oh, I got these backwards. I'm glad I noticed that. Not sure why or how I got those backwards, but that would have been a nasty bug. So um, one is basically an exclamation point. Wow, these are all wrong, actually. What did I do here? Looks like I almost got these backwards. Yeah, I do have these backwards for some reason. Five is correct, but that's like the only one. Right, now that's correct. Not sure what I was thinking there. I must have been tired when I put that in. Uh, okay, so anyway. Um, so here uh, we have um, we have that. Uh, and then why are we adding 32 to that? That actually I don't think is neat. You know what? Let me run this real quick because I have a feeling this is kind of messed up. I must have been really tired when I wrote that part. So, yeah, those are right. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Oops. Okay. All right, so that's fixed. Uh, yeah, I don't know what I was thinking with this. Probably copy pasta from this or something stupid. Anyway, so that handles A through Z and zero through nine. Um, and then basically we have uh, this down here to handle anything else. So uh, in this case, it's a space. We're not gonna take shift into account at all. Um, and uh, instead we're just going to pass through the key code, which is gonna be 32 um, and call it a day. If we get anything else, we are basically going to say uh, it's not valid for entry and it's a zero. So we check down here to see that the key code is not zero um, before actually doing anything with our text. So that's kind of our way to keep um, stupid things from happening. Um, I have a to-do in here. We also want to um, keep a history of the entered commands so that you can just press like up or down um, to get uh, the previous commands, sort of like in a, um, a Linux terminal, for example. Um, but I don't have that implemented yet. Okay. So I know there's a few of you um, out there, so I just want to kind of stop for a second and uh, say hi and welcome to you guys. Um, do you guys have any questions um, so far on anything? Uh, if, you, if you do, feel free to always, you know, uh, type something in the chat. I am watching that. So uh, if you guys do have any questions, feel free to, to go ahead and throw those up there. All right, cool. I will take that as a no for now. Um, all right, so next. Um, we've already gone over the create, the load. Uh, the update is probably the last thing that we need to do that is kind of the last major piece of this. So yeah, let's let's do that. Uh, let me get rid of this. So we have a little bit more room here. How many terminals do I have open? All right. So uh, the update uh, is basically done. Uh, it's called uh, every, uh, every frame. So in the game C, uh, we have update. Uh, let's see. Here it is, debug console update. So that's called um, every frame. And what this basically does is checks the state pointer to see if it's dirty. Uh, the state pointer uh, dirty flag gets set incidentally when uh, a, um, a move up or a move down is called, right? Because we need to change uh, basically anything that's going to change um, the value of the text um, for that uh, console display. Anything that could potentially cause that value to change, we go ahead and set a dirty flag. So um, we have these move functions where we move up or down a line, move to top, move to bottom. Those all set the dirty flag. Um, and then uh, the, let's see. Also, uh, I believe the right also sets that up here at the top. Um, yeah, right here. 
So uh, whenever we um, go ahead and um, receive a new line that's been written to the console, um, that also sets that dirty flag. So down here, we have um, our line count, which is basically the total number of lines that we have, um, our max number of lines that we are going to uh, display. So it's basically going to take the minimum value of the display count, or if there are um, less lines to display than the display count, it will go ahead and attempt to get that. Um, and then uh, we'll go ahead and calculate what the minimum line is. So um, that basically takes uh, the max lines to display um, and the line offset into account, um, and then uh, figures out what the first line to draw is, and then the max line is basically gonna be um, the last line that we draw. And then um, we go ahead and we set up a buffer. This should be big enough for now, um, just to keep this on the stack instead of the heap, right? Um, and so basically what we do is we loop through each individual line um, within uh, our, our lines here, and we uh, go ahead and get the length of that line, and we go ahead and write that out. Now, we could probably do this without a loop, um, and it would be, it probably wind up being about the same speed. So I'm not worried about, um, terribly worried about efficiency here because uh, we're never gonna be dealing with all that much text. Um, and then uh, we're gonna go ahead at the end of the line and we're going to append a new line to that, right? So that's gonna move this buffer position along and allow us to, that's how we're gonna get the multiple lines to show up. So we're basically gonna write out the line, then append a new line a character, which will um, move that down to the next line and then um, move that buffer. Uh, let's see. So um, finally, we go ahead and we terminate the string. Um, we uh, set the text to uh, what we have uh, set up here in our buffer. And then uh, we go ahead and unset the dirty flag. So uh, that is more or less um, what we, the way that this whole thing works, right? It's, it's not terribly complicated. It looks like a lot of code, but it, it really isn't. It's only a few hundred lines and that's really only because of formatting things and I tried to comment it, right? Um, the other thing is we have the ability to get pointers to the UI text objects. Again, this is hacky um, just because we don't have everything in place that we need to draw this properly right now. So we have to go ahead and obtain pointers to these UI text objects to be able to draw them. Um, that is done down here. Uh, let's see. So we have, um, when we're generating our UI packet, uh, we go ahead and we get the uh, text. So if it's, it is loaded, um, this will return a pointer to a UI text object. If it's not loaded, um, that it'll just return a null pointer. And so basically we say, uh, if uh, we have that, um, then we should also check um, you know, to see whether or not it's visible as to whether or not we need to draw it. So if we have that and it's visible, then um, we'll go ahead and increment the count by two. Um, and then we'll go ahead and um, we will allocate a temporary array off of our linear allocator for our frame um, so that uh, we have the correct number of um, texts, right? Or pointers to that. We'll set the first two to our example ones uh, that we have on the screen. And then if we're rendering the debug console, we'll set the second and third, I should say the third and fourth indices to uh, the debug console text and the console entry text, right? So that's how we handle that. Uh, let's see, gobsmack goose, just lurking so far. Console setup does look nice. Okay, cool. Well, thank you and welcome. Um, it's great to have you here. And uh, yeah, we're just uh, kind of going over um, the first feature that we're we're adding, um, I guess, using this new format, right? So uh, I'm not doing a whole lot of live programming this time, but the next set of features we definitely will be. So let's see. Um, I think that covers everything at this level. So we've covered that. Uh, I guess the next thing to do is going to be to cover the console itself. Uh, so we'll take a look at the H file first, just to kind of get a idea of everything that goes into it. So um, this essentially is our entire console consumer interface. Um, the only thing we ever need to worry about is a write. So again, um, uh, 
this is what the callback will look like uh, whenever we need to write to a console consumer. Um, and so uh, that takes an instance, a level, and a message. So we already saw that on our debug uh, console. Uh, let's see. So uh, the other thing that I want to point out here is uh, we also have these console commands. So this is something else I've put into place. Uh, so a console command is something where you can um, have a callback to a console command and send along a context with that. Um, and so console commands, basically you register a console command um, uh, here. So you say, this is what the command is. Um, that'll just take a string. Um, and then how many arguments it should have and what the callback should be to that. Um, and basically, uh, the way that this will work is uh, it will pass along uh, a context uh, object, which is this. And it'll say, this is how many arguments we have. These are the arguments itself. And if we look at this argument, they are strings. So all um, console functions will pass um, all of its data as strings. And then it's up to the consumer of that to parse that to whatever data type it actually needs. So um, generally speaking, we're not going to handle any sort of complex object pars uh, parsing or passing uh, for console commands. Uh, all we're going to do here is support basic types like strings, um, floats, and integers. Um, and that should be more than enough to um, handle anything we need to do through the console. So uh, we can register um, these commands using this. Um, and whenever that command is input into uh, the, uh, the entry box into the debug console, for example, um, it will go ahead and kick that off and execute a function. So um, we have uh, the register consumer here. We have the register command. Uh, then we have a uh, write line here. So uh, this console write line is actually called by the logger. Um, so the logger will say, hey, We've received this logging message that needs to be written out. Um, go ahead and store that in the console as well. And then the console execute command um, is executed from the debug console, which we saw earlier. So um, this guy is actually called here, right? So um, that is basically what the interface looks like for this. Obviously, like any other system, uh, we have the initialize and shutdown. Um, so we have a pointer to hold a memory requirement, and then we can allocate that memory and call it a second time and pass the memory, um, and then a shutdown, right? So let's look at the uh, implementation of this. If I can type today, all right? So uh, we have a few more structures within uh, the, the implementation of this. Um, we have the console consumer itself, um, which is uh, what's registered. So uh, that uh, obviously holds an instance and a, uh, a callback, so a, a function, uh, a pointer to a function, right? Um, and then uh, a console command obviously has a name, an argument count, and again, a pointer to a function to be called uh, for a callback whenever that command is executed. Next, we have our console state. Uh, console uh, is also a static singleton, um, which is fine in this case. Uh, we're never going to have more than one of these. So it makes uh, sense to, to kind of set it up this way. Uh, let's see, is this considered debug infrastructure for non-dev use as well? So yeah, uh, actually, so the idea behind uh, a console like this is to uh, give people like technical artists and game scripters uh, a little bit of feedback so they can um, register console commands of their own um, or um, temporary global variables or anything like that so that they can kind of adjust and tweak things on the fly um, as well. So uh, this will have multiple uses, right? So this is something that you would um, generally have in like a debug build, um, but uh, you, I suppose you could ship it if you wanted to, um, at least the, the debug console portion of it, you could. Um, it's really up to you. Uh, and, and how you want to use it and how much, you know, modability, is that a word? How much modability you would want um, to have. Okay. So our console state uh, basically holds um, our consumers and our registered commands, right? Um, and so uh, when we call initialize, obviously our memory requirement is made up of the size of our uh, state structure, as well as our console consumer times max consumer count. Now I have indicated a maximum of 10 for our consumers because um, I can't see us ever having more 
consumers than 10. Um, I really, I can only really think of three or four off the top of my head that we're ever going to really have. And right now we only have one, but I'll resume, I'll, I'll reserve enough space for 10. Um, that way if somebody wants to add one, they can. So, um, Obviously, we go through the same thing that we've gone through in a lot of our systems where we um, zero out the memory. Um, we go ahead and set up our state pointer. Um, we also set up our consumers array. Um, and then we go ahead and uh, create a array for our registered commands. Um, our shutdown just releases. Um, oops, actually, I missed something here. So um, actually, it zeroes out the memory, but we should also release this guy. So we should destroy this DRA. Um, and then zero out the memory. Okay. So there's that. Um, and then uh, when we register a consumer, um, we basically, first off, make sure that the current consumer count plus one is less than the max consumer count um, because we want to make sure that uh, we're not going to overflow that. Um, and then we go ahead and we get a pointer to um, the next free um, spot in that array, which is just going to be, um, you know, the consumer count, right? Um, so we go ahead and get a, a pointer to that. Uh, we set the instance and the callback and then increment that consumer count. Um, the console write line, all that does is loops through all the consumers um, and then uh, calls that consumer's callback, passing through the instance if it has one, and then passes through the level and message. Um, the register command, um, again, just asserts uh, that uh, we have a state pointer and that uh, the command was actually passed, that a, vo a valid pointer was passed. Um, and then uh, we have a, a command count, and then we basically just loop through um, each of these commands, and we are doing a case insensitive uh, string search on this. Now, one thing that we could do um, here a little bit differently is we could use a hash map for this. Um, and then hash the command string on the way in, and then just uh, do a quick, simple search into a, um, you know, a hash table uh, to get the index of the array. We've done this in, in multiple other parts of the engine, but I can't see us actually having so many commands that that's an issue. So right now, I just kind of did it the naive, simple way. Um, and if we want to to sort of uh, speed this up or or um, optimize it, we can always do that later. Um, so uh, if for right now, um, we just say if we actually find one uh, that is the same uh, name uh, or is the exact same as our command here, then we say, hey, we've already we've already registered a command with this name, um, so you can't do it. Otherwise, we go ahead and we enter a new command. So we set the argument count function and name and push it to the array. Uh, when we execute, um, we pass the entire string um, command, right? So um, whenever we enter a command on the console, it might be uh, something like uh, exec uh, function, right? And then it might have A for its first argument and like 3.14 for its second argument and maybe two for its third argument. And so basically the way that our function commands or our console commands will work is the uh, first argument is always the name of the function itself. Uh, they're separated by a space and then argument one, space, argument two, space, argument three. Etc. Etc. And so, if you think about it, uh, the most obvious way to handle this would basically just be to do a DRA create and another string split, splitting by space. Uh, and that's exactly what we do here. I have a to do here though, because this does not handle um, the case where you have. Uh, in fact, let me actually put. Let me put this back. So one thing that this is not going to handle is um, this case, right? Um, wow, I can't type today. So uh, if you have a space in the middle of a string, this is not going to handle that. Um, and it's actually going to count it as a separate argument. So uh, that could definitely be an issue. Um, so uh, that's something that I need to come back and actually handle. Um, and that's going to be a an enhancement to the string split to take another argument that says, um, how to handle quoted strings, basically. Um, but I don't have that yet, so I've just basically put it to do there for now. Um, so basically what we need to do is we have uh, our part count, which is how many um, 
elements that this split into, right? So we are trimming all entries um, and we are not including uh, empty entries, right? So this will give us, um, this will handle like if somebody double spaces or, or something like that. Um, and so we need to, um, so we need to have at least one part here, right? Because that first part is the command itself. So if it's less than one, um, we're actually going to clean up the split array, destroy the parts array, and return false, right? Because that's rubbish. Like if you if you didn't even include anything and we just wind up with an empty string, uh, there's nothing to be processed, right? Uh, if uh, otherwise, uh, we can write the line back out to the console. So what we're going to do is the first thing before we try any sort of processing is we are going to um, basically call our string format here and write a, uh, a double dash um, greater than sign um, and then the command itself. So we're basically just going to echo it back to the console. So that way we can see exactly what we've typed. So we do that here, um, just saying log a level info and then the temp, right? And then um, here I've, I've mentioned once again, uh, the way we're going to handle this is, you know, string comparisons are slow. They suck. Yes. But this is just a debug tool. Um, it's, it's really only going to be ever be used when you enter something in the console. It doesn't need to be lightning fast, right? So simple is, is, uh, is what's preferred here. So um, we're basically going to loop through um, all of our commands, our registered commands. Um, and then we'll do a string comparison against the first part, which is obviously the command. Um, if they are equal, then we're going to say, hey, we found a command. Um, and then we're going to take the argument count, which is uh, the part count at minus one. So this is the provided argument count. And the provided argument account, excuse me, the provided argument count must match the expected member uh, number of arguments for the command. So when you register a command, you're saying, hey, this is how many arguments it expects, um, and those things must match. If they don't, uh, it's considered to be an error case, um, and we'll actually say, hey, this command requires X number of arguments, but only Y uh, amount were provided. Uh, otherwise, we go ahead and execute it. So we set up a context. Uh, we set up the argument count. Um, if the argument count is greater than zero, then we set up an array, and we uh, pass through a... Um, basically a, uh, not a copy, but like uh, a um, a string for each one of the parts, right? We just use the parts uh, as they are, right? And then we go ahead and pass that function um, to the, uh, or we pass that context rather to the uh, commands function callback, right? And so we execute that. And then when that's done executing, um, it says, hey, if we had arguments, um, then we go ahead and free that array so we don't leak the memory. Um, and then um, we come down here and we say, if the command was not found, we just uh, echo an error that says uh, command not found or doesn't exist. And we set the has error equals true. We clean up the uh, split array, destroy the D array, and then return um, the inverse of has error. So um, the function should return success or failure. Um, and in this case, uh, we're just returning whether or not that has an error, okay? And that is uh, basically the, the function uh, or the console itself. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, one thing that we want to do in the logger, and I have not done this yet, is we have all of this file handling stuff in here. We're actually writing out to uh, the log file that is actually, uh, do we have... It's going to be in the bin folder, the console.log, right? So we're writing this out all the time. And so uh, this is one of the things that we need to actually set up a separate consumer for. So that we're probably going to wind up handling in that. I'm thinking probably in the next stream. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, set that up. Uh, and that way we can actually set up uh, and use our job system to handle that as well. Um, but for right now... Um, in our logging, when we uh, do a log output, uh, we will have already done um, all of the string formatting, including prepending uh, the level um, and all of that stuff. Um, so we actually just pass this along to console consumers here. So um, this uh, this right here, uh, this platform uh, console right error, 
Um, this is actually what outputs to uh, the debug console, so um, either the terminal or here, right? Uh, those uh, actually additionally are also going to be a console consumer of their own. So um, basically this is going to turn turn into its own console consumer and this is going to turn into its own console consumer. We just haven't done it yet. So we're going to rely on the console itself to um, handle all of that for us. All right. Um, so that pretty much does it for the console stuff for now. Um, that is... Uh, console commands, the debug console, and uh, obviously the console itself. We have not done KBARs, so that is something we are going to be implementing um, live on stream. Um, and so, let's see, what do what do we want to do next? Um, I guess we could go into we could take a look at key maps real quick. I guess um, because we do actually have. Um, we do actually have key maps install, uh, implemented. So um, I guess we could very quickly kind of touch on that. Um, so one of the things that we had in the previous version, and I'm actually going to switch to the main branch here. For, oh, I'm not gonna be able to because I don't have the changes committed. Bollocks, all right. Let me just commit these changes real quick. Um, console bug fixes. All right, uh, clear. All right, so um, one of the things that we had in uh, the old version of this um, was in our update loop, uh, we had all kinds of stuff like this, where um, we'd have to be checking to see if the key is up um, and whether it was previously down, um, or uh, we could check uh, things like this where we say, hey, if A or left is pressed, do this thing. And we have you know tons of these things, right? Um, this is fine when you're just kind of lightweight testing stuff but it's not something that you would ever want to release a product with, right? It's not flexible. And it becomes very difficult to switch the way your input works um, on the fly. So for example, um, we have keys bound like um, 0, 1, and 2, L, um, P. Uh, we have WASD, W, um, or... Uh, Q, E, you know, all these common keys. So if we were to open up the console with uh, these things still active and we were trying to type into the console, um, these commands would continue to execute even though we have the console open, which is dumb. Uh, the way that it should work is if we have something that is like a, um, something like a text box that we're entering into, right? That should have full focus of, of input. Um, so everything that you enter on the keyboard, um, within reason, should go uh, into that particular text box, right? Um, and we don't want any other commands uh, sort of executing um, other than that. And the other thing is we want the ability to override uh, particular keys in different situations. So uh, right now, um, in this version anyways, uh, the escape key uh, is actually responsible for quitting the application. Um, but if we have the console open, uh, then we aren't actually going to be, um, we, we don't necessarily want to do that right then. Um, we want to be able to hit the escape key to close the console, but not close the application. So um, in that case, we would need a way to say, hey, I need the escape key to either do something different or do nothing at all. And this is where key maps come into play. So um, what we have is, uh, Feature Oh really? Anyway. Um and ignore the branch name because I was originally gonna do something different on this branch and decided against it. So the branch name here makes no sense. But um 
So we have uh, this concept of key maps, um, and I'm actually going to go to uh, key map. I'm going to go to keymap.h so we can talk about this a little bit. Um, and by the way, um, any of you guys that are uh, that are watching this, if if you're enjoying this, please um, you know spread the word because uh, I've just started this Twitch channel, um, and I definitely need to get my my follower count up here so that uh, people are aware of it as well. So. Um, please do follow. I would greatly appreciate it and uh, check out my YouTube channel as well. There's a link uh, on the about page um, to that as you know, so you can get all of the uh, the previous content on this. Um, okay, so uh, how do I want to tackle this? I think the best way to approach this is uh, key maps are basically going to be um, something that we need to apply one on top of the other. So um, we need the ability to have multiple key maps potentially active at once so that we can combine logic, but then also uh, the ability have the ability to um, override that logic as well. And so um, if we take a look at a key map, a key map is essentially, is essentially a list of key entries, right? And a key map entry is a set of bindings for a particular key. So this means that we can have a list of bindings that are bound to a key. So that means we can technically, on one key map, we can bind one key to do multiple things at once, right? Um, now we're not always gonna need that, but we may need that functionality. Um, we, we may need that functionality. Uh, and here's why. Because a key binding, um, which is uh, tied to a key, can also have uh, things like modifier keys. Um, it can have different key binding types, which we have up here. So we have um, undefined, which means that uh, we just have, that's sort of the default key binding for every key. Um, we have a press binding type. We have a release binding type. So that means that the, um, the binding callback only gets executed on a press or a release. We have hold. So that means it only gets pressed or only gets called back um, when we've held the key for at least one frame. Um, and only when it's being held. So um, you can define um, a, a key binding that doesn't have press or release, but only has hold, right? So only when it's held down, do this. Um, and that would be for like moving a camera around. An example of press um, would be like uh, when I press the tilde, bring up the console. Um, you could do the same thing with release if you wanted to. So only when you release the key, it does that. Um, and then you have um, what is called unset, which is used to disable a key binding on a lower level map. So we'll come back to that. Um, in fact, that's probably going to wind up going away for reasons I'll bring up soon. But um, for right now, um, the three that we're worried about is uh, press, release, and hold, right? So you have those different key bindings. And you can have um, those different key binding types for the same key. So you can then say, um, if I press the key, call function A. If I release the key, call function B. And if I hold the key, call function C. Um, or you could technically say, if I hold the key, call functions C, D, and E, right? You can have as many as you possibly want. Um, and that gives us a way to say, um, we have uh, multiple key bindings for a particular key, right? So the key map binding itself um, takes the bind type. Modifiers, so the modifiers are basically um, either none, meaning there's no modifiers, or a modifier key such as shift, control, or alt being held. So that means um, if there's any modifiers, that means, uh, for example, if uh, we set the modifier control, that means if you hit control A, that uh, that binding will only execute if you're holding control and you press A, right? Um, and so that's what that is. Uh, we have a callback. We have the ability to pass user data uh, with that key map binding. And we also have a next, uh, which is a pointer to another key map binding. And that is because the key map bindings are actually internally stored as a linked list. So basically the way this works is as you bind things, it's basically just gonna keep a linked list of all the bindings for that particular key and loop through them all, see if it should execute and execute them, right? Um, and then uh, the last bit here is we have this flag on the key map itself that says overrides all. So this is useful in the case of like where we open the, um, the console, right? We don't want any of the other key bindings for the other stuff that we have defined to actually execute. So we can set that to true 
And then that means that only key bindings for this key map will actually be executed. What do I mean by that? Well, if we look at the implementation of this, and so we go key map. Uh, so we have, uh, let's see, so we have a key map create, um, which just basically um, goes through and creates a key map, right? Zero is the memory, um, defaults to overrides all to false, um, and then sets up uh, no bindings on every key, but also sets up the key for every key, right? So this is just sort of filling in that struct by default. Uh, the keys, max keys, by the way, is 222, um, so you'll never have more than that. And then we return map. Um, so let's see. So when we uh, create our key map, um, we have the ability to add bindings to it, right? And so uh, we pass the pointer um, of a map um, that we're adding to, the key, the entry type, the modifiers, uh, pointer to user data that we want to be passed along, and then a callback. So an example of user data might be the game instance, for example. Um, and then we go through um, and we take a look uh, to see if that the map was actually passed in. Um, we grab uh, pointers uh, to this, we iterate the linked list um, to get all the way to the end of the list, and then we go ahead and we allocate a new entry, fill all those things in, and then um, add that to the linked list, right? Uh, the remove basically just does the same thing, it just basically goes through, um, iterates the linked list, and then finds the entry and strips it out, um, and then sets the previous node to the node next, right? So that's how you just remove that. It removes it from the, little, the, the middle of the list. Um, we're not really here to discuss, um, to discuss rather, um, linked lists. So if you guys don't know how those work, we can talk about that at some other time. Um, all right, so uh, the next thing is um, we have uh, key maps, but where are they actually used, okay? And uh, as you may or may not have guessed, depending on how many of these you've seen, uh, we have our input system. So our input system is actually going to keep a key map stack. Um, and you'll notice that we have a stack here, which is also something that's new. So we have a new stack structure. Um, and I'll kind of go over the input of that, or the uh, implementation of that rather, here in a second. But um, we have a stack of key maps. And that is how we are going to keep track of what key maps should be active and not. So uh, anytime you need a key map to be active, you push it onto the stack, and anytime you need it to be inactive, you pop it. Um, now, obviously a stack, you're, you're not gonna be able to pull things out of the middle of it. You can only you know, add and remove in a stack. And there's a very specific reason for that. Because of the way that key map should be used, um, you should never really need anything other than a stack. And so, um, all we do is uh, in the input system initialize, we create our stack here. And then um, the, let's see, does the update actually do anything with this? Yes, it does. So, um, yeah, do I want to do that here? Let me come back to that. Um, so, uh, why is this? All right, got a bunch of dead code in there. Let me get rid of that. Okay, so um, the first thing I'll cover is, is sort of the, the push and pop, which are pretty self-explanatory, I, I feel like, but let's go ahead and just kind of knock it out anyways. So you've got a key map that you've created. Um, you want to push that, AKA activate it, right? So um, you are gonna come in here to uh, the uh, state pointer, check the state pointer, check the map, um, and then try to push the key map onto the stack. If for some reason that fails, we'll bleat about it in return. Otherwise, we won't. Right, let's get rid of this. That is dead, that was something I was trying. Uh, and then the other thing is um, input key map pop. We will go ahead and pop that, right? So we have the ability to push and pop um, the key map uh, stack, right? So the next thing is we need to actually take a look at how our events are actually handled. So when we have our input process key, 
that's called. Um, and that's called on a key press and release um, by the OS, essentially. Um, we are going to come down here. And after we do all of our debug checking here, which we should probably get rid of this at some point, right? We don't really need that anymore, but we'll come back to it. Uh, we're going to check for key bindings and we're going to iterate the key maps uh, top down on the stack, right? So we're going to start at the top and then work our way down um, in the stack. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is uh, get a count of the maps we have, get uh, a, uh, an array of those, and we're basically going to start at the end, right? So map count minus one. We're going to say as long as this is greater than or equal to zero, uh, we'll go ahead and do the thing, and then we will um, decrement m as it goes. So we'll take a pointer to the map, and then uh, we'll go ahead and um, start at the first binding um, for the particular key that we are dealing with, right? That was passed here. Um, so we're going to start at the, uh, the binding zero, right? And we're just going to take the address of that. So if there's nothing there, that'll be a null pointer um, or, or zero, right? Um, and then we're going to say um, unset is false. And uh, we'll come back to what that means in just a second. So um, the binding, if uh, we actually have a binding, we're going to uh, loop through this as long as we have a binding, right? So um, we're going to start from the zeroth entry here, process, and then move to the next. And then if that exists, we'll keep working um, our way through all the bindings in that linked list. So if the binding type is unset, then we're going to say unset is true, and we're going to break the loop. Um, and uh, otherwise, if the, uh, the type is press, right? So if we are pressed here, if that's true, and the binding type is press, then the binding callback, um, and if the binding callback exists, and we pass the modifier check, then we're gonna go ahead and make the callback, right? We're gonna say key, binding type, modifiers, user data. Uh, the check modifiers takes a look at the key map modifiers that are passed through and says, okay, um, if the modifier shift bit is set, then uh, we just need to check, okay, uh, is shift L shift or R shift down. If none of those um, are down, then we return false, meaning it failed to check. So if it's required and it doesn't have it, um, it will return false. Um, it does the same with control. So it checks control, L control, R control, returns false if um, any one of those things are not down. Uh, and then it does the same with alt. If it passes all of these, then it returns true and it's considered um, passing the test, right? So that could be if none of those flags are set, then it'll just pass, right, for example. So um, if the binding type matches and uh, there's a callback and the check modifiers passes, then we make the callback. The same thing is true for release, right? So that is press and release. It's just done in line with the system we already have and that's all there is to it. If we hit an unset that's detected or the map is marked to override all, we stop processing. So um, if we have unset or a map overrides all is true, then we break. And that is going to be breaking out of this loop, meaning it will not process any further maps. Um, and the reason I'm saying this unset is probably gonna go away is because initially I was going to allow you to unset individual mappings, but I don't, I don't feel like that makes sense. Um, but I haven't completely completely thought it through yet, so I don't want to remove it just yet. Because we might want to, we, we, want, we might want to unset the escape key, for example, um, but maybe not everything else. So, yeah. Um, so anyways, um, that is how the, uh, the press and release work. Uh, so the other one that uh, I kind of skipped over before was in the input update, right? This is called on every update frame. Uh, and this is where the hold bindings are actually handled because this has to be checked every single frame so that we can detect what's being held. So this basically replaces uh, all of the movement code that we had in our game that would check uh, the state of keys. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say uh, is key down for the key and was key down in the last frame. So if it's down this frame and it was down the last frame, we're gonna consider that a hold event, right? And so again, we're just gonna map, we're gonna loop through and um, all of our maps, we're going to check 
for a binding on those keys. We're going to loop through each individual binding. Um, and then if the binding type is hold um, and we pass the check modifiers and there's a callback, go ahead and make the callback. Right? And that's really all there is to it. This logic is almost exactly the same as it is, as it is um, in the press and release. Uh, it's just in this case, uh, we uh, are handling the hold, okay? So, um, what is next? I think that is actually, I think that actually might be it as far as uh, this aspect of it. I don't think there's anything else in here to really go over. So I guess the uh, the last and final piece of this um, is we, we do have um, a new object here. Uh, we have the, uh, the stack container, right? So a stack is basically going to take a fixed element size, um, the element count that it currently has, uh, the number um, or the, the amount of allocated memory. So this is not um, to be confused with, you know, how many elements can we handle, but this is um, basically the element times, uh, element size times the element count, right? Um, that's how much we're, we're allocated. How much memory do we actually have? And then the memory itself, okay? So we create uh, the stack here. Um, we take a pointer to an out stack and the element size. Um, our destroy is pretty self-explanatory and then push and pop and that's it, right? It's a very simple interface. Uh, if we go into the, um, the implementation of it, it's not even 100 lines of code, right? It's pretty simple. So um, I'll come back to this in a second. So the first thing we have is uh, our stack create. So first off, we make sure we have a valid pointer. Um, then we zero the memory within that. Um, we set the element size. We set the element count to zero. And then we're actually going to call this internal stack ensure allocated, which takes a pointer to the stack and then it takes the count of elements that we should be able to hold, right? And we're going to uh, reserve space for one. And so what this is gonna do is this function says, okay, um, if the amount we have allocated, which right now in this case would be zero, is less than the element size times count, right? Um, which will give us our new allocated account. Um, then we go ahead and allocate uh, a new uh, element. And right now I have this tagged as an array. I may or may not keep that, I'm not sure. But um, then we go ahead and we check uh, and we say, uh, well, does the stack already have memory? Um, in our case, it's not going to for the very first time, so it skips this, but if it does have memory, then it goes ahead and copies the memory from that old memory block um, to a temp our temporary um, block here with our new size. So it copies all the data out of the old into the new, and then it uh, frees the old and then sets the S memory to the temp, which is the new here, and then up to the updates the allocated to be count times element size, okay? So this is just a, um, a quick way to uh, encapsulate this to make sure that we have enough memory um, allocated for the count that we provide. So uh, that is create and ensure allocated. Uh, destroy, all that does is goes through here and says if we have uh, memory in the stack, free it. Um, we know how, how much it is based on the allocated. We free it against that same tag that we allocated against. Um, and then we zero out the memory for uh, the stack itself. And then we let whatever manages that deal with it. Stack push, uh, again, we just check for a valid pointer. We ensure allocated. So we check the element count of the stack plus one. So we, we ensure allocated against that. Um, we go ahead and we perform uh, a memory copy basically by uh, starting at the S memory address, we cast that to U64 and then add element count times S element size. Um, and we will not have ele uh, added to element count yet. So this is the old size, right? So we're basically just moving to that part in memory. And then um, we go ahead and copy uh, the element data for the element size at that point. And then we go ahead and we increment the element count, right? So that's the push. The pop uh, sort of undoes that. So um, in our case, uh, we actually have uh, a pointer to the stack and then um, out element data to, to hold the popped element if we need it, uh, because uh, sometimes we will. So uh, first we check for um, a, uh, a valid pointer for both. Uh, actually, that probably should be 
I should check both actually. Um, and and to hold element data output. Right, so we should be checking both of those, okay? Um, so uh, this basically just checks to make sure we have valid pointers. Um, we say if the element count is less than one, then we just warn and say, hey, what are you doing, you dingus? Uh, you, can't, you can't pop from an empty stack, right? And then we return false. Uh, the K memory copy, uh, we basically just uh, set the target as the element data. We go ahead and move um, the pointer to the end of the element count list. Um, and then we copy uh, for the element size, right? So we just copy that uh, out to the element data. We uh, subtract from the element count, and then we go ahead and return true. And uh, that is that is basically it. So yeah, I think um, I think that's probably about all I want to cover for today. Um, so I know there's uh, there's only a couple of you out there because um, I know the stream you know obviously doesn't have a lot of followers yet. But uh, if you haven't already, if you could uh, just toss me a follow, I'd greatly appreciate it. Um, I'm trying to get this, uh, this Twitch channel off the ground. Um, and like I said, uh, all of the content that is done here will be re-uploaded to uh, YouTube um, at some point in the very near future. Um, and uh, that will be available there as a new Kohi video. So... Um, yeah, if you guys don't have any questions, I think uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up for the day because we've streamed for two hours now. So um, I think that's not a bad start. I'm actually surprised we actually got through um, everything that I could um, that I had prepped. So covered a lot of ground today. Um, we probably won't cover ground quite this quickly in future streams, um, only because. You know, the code won't really be written. I'm going to be writing it from scratch. All right, cool. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and end this here. Um, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, uh, please give me a, uh, a like for the video, thumbs up there. Um, go ahead and, uh, if you haven't already, uh, consider subscribing. And um, yeah, just hit the little bell notification icon there so you get uh, notified as to when uh, new videos in this or my other series drops. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next time.